Hi, we're Haley Perry and I'm Liz Bessel. And we are two Rhode Island based uh, fiber artists who are here to present the Expressive Art of Stitching, a program that was sponsored by Fiber Art Now and hosted by the Rochambeau Library on Saturday, January 20th, 2024. Yep. And this is our uh, video component where we're going to talk about what is stitching, what is expressive stitching, share a little about our work. Yep. Talk a little bit about the mindfulness aspect of expressive stitching. Yep, absolutely. And yeah, just hope that we can introduce more of you to using your craft and your art to be more mindful and move kind of forward in, with your creativity. Absolutely. We hope to inspire people out there to start stitching in whatever form it takes. And we're here to show you some of the forms that we use in our own work. So we hope that you enjoy this presentation and uh, follow along. So thank you again. Yep. Thank you. Hi, this is Haley Perry, and I'm going to be the first presenter of The Art of Expressive, Expressive Stitching by Liz Bessel and Haley Perry. And I wanted to start off by showing some of our work on the left there is As the Crow Flies by Liz Bessel, and on the right is some of my uh, work, this piece called Growth by myself, Haley Perry. And we are two fiber artists from uh, the Rhode Island area, and we both work with different stitching techniques, Liz being um uh, any different kinds of quilt stitching and embroidery and um, slow stitching, hand stitching techniques, and myself as a, a hooked rug artist. So uh, even though we employ different techniques in our work, we've both seen a lot of value in the slow sort of hand stitching techniques that we do, and we've watched our work grow because of it and become more expressive. So let's start off by defining what stitching even is. Stitching is the art of joining uh, two different kinds of fabric together with thread, yarn, etc. Uh, knitting and crochet are also considered stitching, um, even though that's not necessarily what we're currently using in our work. You can even sew stitches on different types of machines, but the hand kind of stitching is the one that results in the most kind of repetitive movements, um, leading to a more meditative mind. And you can use stitching to make marks, explore color. You can even use it to make functional objects. Um, so it's, stitching is a very broad term for all those different things. Expressive stitching is sort of the state in which you feel from doing this kind of handwork. It's mindful, it leads to meditation or a flow state. Um, it allows one to be immersed in the present moment. Again, that's kind of the same as that flow state. It also helps you um, solve problems and increases your neuroplasticity. If so it fights against aging, reduces stress and lowers blood pressure. Um, it also le leads to a sense of accomplishment um, by actually releasing dopamine and results in more expressive artwork, which we're going to talk about. So as I mentioned before, I am a hooked rug artist, um, and this technique is uh, native to right where we are, New England, Maritime Canada, and North America. Um, and it's a process in which I use wool fabric strips or different types of yarns uh, to create loops over and over and over again on a foundation material um, to make uh, rugs. You can use these in your home. You can use them um, as home decor items or functional objects. Uh, I tend to make more expressive artwork out of them, uh, wall hangings and things like that. It's really simple technically. Um, you really only need a foundation material uh, such as burlap, monk's cloth, or linen, uh, a hook, a hoop, or a frame uh, to stretch your foundation fabric taut, and then you need whatever kind of material you're going to be looping through that foundation material to make your project. So pretty simple supply-wise um, and pretty humble technique. So here is a video that I'm going to show. Um, hmm, I can't click on it here, but you can find this video on YouTube. That's Loop by Loop Studio on YouTube, and it shows the simple stitching technique. What's shown here on this slide is basically the hook in my hands, the foundation fabric stretched within the hoop. Um, and you can see I have one hand with the hook working on top. On the underside, I am holding a wool fabric strip, um, and then I'm going to be pulling it through loop after loop on this foundation fabric. 
fabric. But you can find that video on um, loopbyloopstudio.com or uh, YouTube Loop by Loop Studio, and you can see how simple this technique is. So my um, journey in the arts uh, started back in the early 2000s when I went to art school and I am a painter, a fine artist trained painter. Um, and I tend to make lots of very abstract work, uh, lots of texture, collage materials, uh, very color focused. And it wasn't until about 2013 that I came when I came out of grad school that I started my rug cooking journey. And um, I started a business called Loop by Loop Studio and I started making rugs that were more commercial based. I now make kits and patterns from my projects and then I sell those to other rug hookers. I also teach rug hooking. But you can see a difference between sort of my, my uh, more commercial work on the right there, that chickadees rug, and my more fine artwork, which is obviously very abstract. Um, and so there's a real divide when, between my work when I started uh, rug hooking and my rug hooking business com between commercial and fine art or craft and fine art, you could say. I do have some great influences when it comes to rug hooking and beyond. Um, I happen to have an aunt named Deanne Fitzpatrick, who is you know, somewhat well known or very well known in the rug hooking world for her large landscape based rugs that are very colorful, very textural. Um, and she's been a great influence on myself as an artist, but also as a businesswoman because she also has a rug hooking business. In the middle there is um, an artist named Liz Albert Fay from Connecticut. And she is somebody who, um, she is a craft artist and a fine artist, but she sort of um, bends what rug hooking can be by making very shaped work um, and very abstract work, work that um, sort of relates back to nature or sort of stretches the boundaries of the craft as we know it. So I'm very influenced by her work as well. And then right now as a, as an artist, I'm influenced by the work of Elizabeth Murray. I always have been, but, um, right now I'm making a lot of shaped work myself. So her paintings and her graphic style is really resonating with me as an artist as well. And she's a painter in the New York area. She's no longer alive, but, um, she made these large, as you can see, very shaped paintings that are very colorful. So my work, uh, after a few years of making more commercial designs, they usually just had a subject matter on a background. I started embedding story into my work and straying from the, that commercial work a bit to make work for myself is what I consider my portfolio work or my more narrative work. Um, and I started finding my own visual language within this type of stitching. My work also became a little more illustrative and I credit that to the years of working with a more commercial subject matter where I was working on objects on background. Um, so I was telling, started telling a more personal narrative using different symbolism in my work, such as um, hands and eyes, crows, the skies started becoming really important. And my work, um, for myself and rug hooking was also very landscape based, which is what I've always considered my paintings. So they started to become a little bit more of a bridge between um, these two types of artwork that, that I have been making, but with a really large addition of being um, story and narrative and person, personal, um, you know, ideas that have really never been in my artwork because I've always been such an abstract artist. The next part of my artwork and sort of where I'm at now is, um, again, I, I mentioned that I'm doing more shaped work. Um, they're mostly abstract with a little bit of touches of nature or the human body within them. But you can see I've strayed from the canvas and the rectangle quite a bit by making more shaped work adding more negative space, meaning I've cut into my rugs, completely removing um, any kind of usability from them. Um, so they become more sculptural in that way. Um, and really 
having them relate a lot more to my artwork. What I've actually done in the couple of years um, that I've been making this kind of work is I've been painting so much more and I've made a series of smaller sketches and paintings that this work is more based upon. So I would have to say that rug hooking has really benefited my practice in that, um, well, in many different ways. Firstly, it, it makes me think very critically when I'm making my designs. Um, and it gives me with hours of meditative hooking time, which positively impacts my health. So this hooking time, as we already kind of mentioned, sort of like this passive flow state, but in that it generates more ideas. So it's it's passive, but it's also very active. Um, rug hooking is also technically very easy. I've taught a lot of people how to rug hook and it's something that I can do with friends. Um, so, you know, there's a community that's been built around rug hooking. Um, and these craft communities tend to be very supportive circles. Um, it has, rug hooking has posed me with kind of technical challenges, even though, um, I just mentioned it's technically very easy. The more I push rug hooking, such as making shaped pieces or, you know, more sculptural pieces from rug hooking, the more it's allowing me to think outside the box. So, and that's enhancing my overall creativity. As I already mentioned, my personal storytelling um, and overall visual language, sort of the, the symbols <clears throat> I use to tell my stories have has become much broader than it ever once was. Um, and that allows me to generate more and more ideas from that language. I start with one idea, such as like the hands, and then I put them in different situations. So it's it's allowed me to, to think more broadly um, and it's really just made me overall a better and more committed artist because it encourages me to work every single day. When doing something like painting, if we just want to compare the two activities, it's um, it's a it's a lot harder for me to stand at the canvas every day to get out my paints and to to do something that I feel is more high pressure than to sort of passively stitch. And this stitching allows me to make a little more progress on my rug every day. And therefore, I am creative every day and I look forward to that creativity every day. So in all these different ways, um, whether it's helping me um, to stitch every day, that stitching time is is helping my mental health because it's, it's um, allowing me to sort of slow down and be in the moment. It's also, like I said, helping me come up with more ideas. And this is all impacting my rug hooking work and my painting work, which is now instead of being complete, two completely separate categories, it's all working together in um, one very satisfying way. And it's really, really, like I said, a credit to um, the mindful stitching that rug hooking has provided me with. So I'm going to end this recording here. And when you come back, uh, Liz Bessel's going to talk a little bit about her work. Hi, I'm Liz Bessel. Um, you just heard from Haley Perry. She talked about what, what expressive stitching means to her. And I'm going to share a little bit with you about what it means to me. Um, expressive stitching to me is a way of working where I'm working slowly, I'm working with my hands. I usually start with one plan and end up in some place totally different. It's almost like my Google map says, would you like to go this way instead? And that's what happens. But I, I listen to what my intuition is telling me and because I'm taking the time to move slowly through my project and be open while I'm doing that, I feel that my work is much more expressive and it reveals a lot about myself to me as I go along. I don't want it to sound too kind of like woo woo, but I do feel like it does that. So I think one of the main things for me is just really being open, be open to changing your plan, be open to just sort of letting your mind wander as you work. That's um, when you're doing repetitive stitching, as Haley mentioned before, you get into that state of flow. If you don't know what that state of flow is, kind of think of when you're doing something that you enjoy and all of a sudden you look at the clock and you realize 45 minutes has gone by and you felt like it was five or 10 minutes, then you were probably in a state of flow. So, you know, we're all looking to be in that in that space when we're working. Um, another thing is 
a lot of fiber artists, a lot of quilters, and I'm coming from that background myself, we have a lot of rules. There are a lot of rules that you've been taught to follow. And what I really want to encourage you to do when you are working in this way, it doesn't mean you have to throw them out the window forever for every project, but just don't be afraid to break the rules. Really just think outside of the box. I mean, I have been given permission by some of my influences, influ people who influence me, You'll, as you'll see, to sort of tie knots on the outside of my project. Or I now really love to, at some point as I'm working, take a photograph of the back of what my work looks like and maybe share that on social media, just to take some of that fear away of, of like, going for perfection or trying to make something perfect. We just want to experience what we're doing and express ourselves. So just be open to those, those things as they come up. Oops, sorry, skipping over a slide. Okay. Do you need to know how to sew? You don't have to know how to sew a stitch to start doing this. Um, a lot of you may be knitters or crocheters or even weavers. Maybe you're not a rug hooker or an embroiderer or a quilter, but if you can, you know, thread a needle, and even if you can't, because we have needle threaders, you will be able to do this. And if you don't, if sewing doesn't appeal to you, then maybe you, you can make stitches with a pen and paper. You know, you just start making repetitive marks making lines, making dots, making X's. That's essentially what you will be doing as you work through this process. You can see in this example, there's just a simple running stitch and then a few X's as we, you know, use this as a demonstration. Okay, I, I, one of my favorite books, this is sort of an inspiration more than an influence, is Steal Like an Artist. And if you haven't heard from it, you can get it at your library. Um, it, it's very well known. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is to give you a sense of freedom to simply copy somebody for a while. I know we all think, oh, the, it, I, an artist, I have to be original. I have to be. And you're putting so much pressure on yourself that it be, can just free, you can just freeze. It becomes debilitating. It becomes paralyzing. So you know, I, I kind of wanted you to think too about, you know, think about when you're learning to write, you, you're you not going to write the great American novel on your first try. First, you have to learn how to write letters. Then you have to learn how to write words. Then you have to learn how to write sentences. We're all going along and we're on this journey. And in order to write a great book, you need to read a lot of great books. So you're going to maybe find a few people you like look at their work. Maybe it's their use of color. Maybe it's, maybe you are a really tidy person and you like everything to be nice and neat. Maybe that's what you appreciate. Just figure out what it is and start copying it. Just copy it. It's going to be your own when you make it because your hands are doing the work. Slowly but surely, by copying somebody else's style, you're going to begin to develop your own language. So the, here are some people I want to share with you who um, have influenced me. The first is Rebecca Ringquist, and she is an embroidery artist, as you can see. She was probably the first person I encountered that got me thinking that I didn't have to follow the rules, that it was, it was okay to step out of that box, that it was all right just to stitch for the sake of stitching. You know, before it was like, oh, I'm going to make X, Y, Z, and I need to do this to make this thing, and that's all I'm going to do. She really, I took an online workshop with her. She invites you to just create for the sheer joy of creating, to experiment with stitches, to experiment with color, to experiment with just making marks, like I mentioned earlier, as if you're doodling, but with a thread and a needle. Um, so I really, really was very influenced with her. I probably started, discovered her maybe like 10 years ago and I just, I really, really was taken with her. The next person I want to talk about, and as I go to the next people, I'm going to give you kind of a little, get, by showing how they have influenced each other, continue to give you that permission to be influenced by others. 
This is Zach Foster, and Zach Foster is a he's a fiber artist. He's a quilter. He works um, a lot with community. He it's very important to him. He really wants to send a message through his work. He works mainly in found um, objects. All of his I won't say all, but the majority of his fiber and his fabric is um, pre-loved, pre-used. He does a lot of thrifting, he finds things on the side of the road. You can see on the picture with, that he's actually in, the work he's looking at, that was a shirt that he found in the ocean when he was walking along the beach. And he took that and turned that into that work of art. And what, what that really exemplifies for me is sometimes I'll start with a fabric that I love. Maybe it's from a favorite piece of clothing I've had. Maybe it's something somebody's given to me. Maybe I have a tea towel that I got while I was on vacation and I want to incorporate it into a piece of art that that matters to me. Um, and I just have to start working with it and maybe just doing a little stitching at the beginning to let that speak to me and see where it wants to go. And sometimes I feel like I'm just along for the ride as I think, you know, Zach kind of was in this, um, in this work. There's a really, really good podcast that he did actually about that work of art. And I will put a link to that in our notes page so that you can listen to that if you're at all interested. Another thing he does is he incorporates a lot of text. You can see that in the other work that is shown. Now, Zach Foster had a fan who kind of followed him on Instagram, and her name was Heidi Parks. And Heidi Parks decided, she was an art teacher, she decided she wanted to become a professional quilter, and she started looking for people to model herself after. And one of those people was Zach Foster. And from there, she developed her own style. She's very into diary quilting, the um, sort of ivory and light colored quilt you see was actually very directly inspired by some of Zach's work where he allows, those are actually folded over seams to show through sheer fabric. Um, so I wanted to include that to show when, how strongly he influenced her. And she always credits him. That's the other thing. When you're influenced through people, share them with other people. That's why I'm, I'm sharing these people with you. Um, it just, I think it's, it just, the more people that see art, the better. And Heidi's really known for her diary quilts. She's known for really, per really personal struggles, taking those and turning them into her artwork. So she's very mindful about what she creates. Uh, she really does a lot with color. I, I really like her sense of color and her shape and the rhythm that I can feel in her work. So along came another quilter who became enamored with Heidi Parks and her name was, is, not was, she's still here, Amanda Nadig. And she, you can see the influence, I think, of both Zach and Heidi in Amanda's work. And with what she does, she actually still is a high school art teacher. She works very small. Heidi and Zach do as well, but I feel like she does a lot of kind of very, very petite, very small works. And then she also does bigger works. I love how she incorporates embroidery kind of abstractly into her work. You'll notice that you can see her stitches. Again, a lot of rhythm. You can definitely see Heidi's influence um, in Amanda's work. And how this comes full circle is Zach Foster took, a note, took notice of Amanda and now they are collaborating and doing a lot of projects together. And you know, working in community and working in conjunction with other people. So I, I always love that chain reaction community, I think in the fiber world is a really big thing. You know, it, it's sort of the, the history of quilting has a lot to do with community. And I, I like when I can see that in the modern world of social media and modern quilting. Let's see, we'll get the next, I can't get my arrow to come up. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I think that um, you can see here, this is some of my work and this is what mindful stitching looks like to me. It, and I'm using mindful, not expressive right now, because when I'm doing, especially the pink, that's where I'm actually quilting all three layers together. 
And I'm just sort of, I didn't make any marks on the fabric ahead of time. I knew I wanted it to flow and kind of feel like maybe water going around stones as it went around these circles. It was a baby blanket I made. And I, I just had something in my head and I kind of let my hands take over. Part of this I did while we were on a road trip. So I was in the car and kind of thinking. And, and as I moved through this project, other projects start opening up in my mind and things about not necessarily only this project, but the thing about the project you're working on will start to, as you're stitching, you will get ideas. It's going to spark ideas in you for other projects going forward. And in the the other photo you'll see here, I've left knots exposed on the right side. I'll tie my knots. I really have kind of gotten into that. And that I started doing, I, I have to say, because I saw um, Amanda and Heidi doing it and I thought it was so liberating. You know, why are we always trying to hide everything we're doing? Everybody knows there's a knot there. Why not just let people see it? It adds texture. It can add rhythm. It can add so much to your work and it just frees you up. And again, none of this was pre-marked. I just went as I as I did it, and this is a combination of actually embroidery stitching and quilting stitches. You know, I was taught never to overlap the two, don't let your stitches be seen. So this is just, it's really liberating. So when we talk about expressive stitching, especially slow stitching and mindful stitching, uh, you know, why don't we just want to get it done? Why don't we want to put it on a machine, get it done, get it out there into the world? For me, as I move through a project, I want to see it evolve. So you can see this is a project that I'm showing you from many different angles. Um, this one little part here, you can see there were no exposed knots down at the bottom in the black and white section. And then in the middle, I've added some black knots with tails. And then actually after consulting and having a creative meeting with Haley, we get together and sort of critique each other's work and bounce things off of each other. She, she suggested that I might want to go bigger and bolder and add some more color to that area. And she was absolutely right. Um, I did that. And so along with being open to what you are working on and sort of ideas that are bubbling up in you. Another thing we, I mentioned community earlier is getting together with other artists and being open to taking criticism constructively. You know, sometimes we think of criticism as a negative word. I think in this case, it's very much a positive word. Um, and asking somebody to put fresh eyes on your project because sometimes there's something inside of you that you're trying to get out and and you might be almost tamping it down but somebody else can see it and say oh my gosh you need to pull this out do more of that and it's amazing what having that feedback from another person can open up in you so just an example is you can tell in the first um photo it, I started with this very symmetrical design. It was originally going to be a diptych with two quilts. Uh, it was very contained. I, I sort of thought of it as a flag. It actually originated from a quilt I did before this. As I was stitching on that, this quilt came to mind. And I didn't really, I thought it was about something else when I started it. And as I moved through the process, I realized I was still working on some of the topics that I had confronted in the quilt that I finished prior to this. So you can see how different the end pro product is on the other side of the slide from the beginning. And that was just a result from, of being open, open to myself, open to suggestions from Haley, like I said, in critiques, um, and just taking the time to go slowly through this project. And when I say slowly, I actually finished this fairly quickly. Um, you will become kind of obsessed sometimes once you start this process, but it was just having it in my hands and looking at it and staying with it and working with it in an intimate way where it wasn't on a machine. I wasn't moving it through or getting frustrated. I was just enjoying the process. 
Now, a lot of times when I finish some of these, when I work this way, I do get to the end and I'll think to myself, hmm, okay, it could have been prettier, could have been a little cleaner, maybe a little more, you know, well thought out, could have followed a pattern and had, as a quilter, you'll know when I talk about those perfect points on your triangles and every seam lining up and every stitch the same size and not being able to see you know, an applique stitch and even know how it's being held on there. But I've decided that in my work, I just don't want that. I want people to see how it's made. I want to learn as I'm going along. I want people to be able to tell that maybe I was angry when I was making this, or maybe I was really happy. Um, it becomes much more of sort of a, a diary process as I'm literally expressing myself. Okay, so to get started for hand stitching, like I mentioned, you do not have to be able to stitch. We'll get you going, you know, you'll be up and running before you know it. And the more you stitch, the more you will develop kind of your own language, your own way of working. You just need fabric and consider repurposing something. You can use old clothes, you can use, I love looking for linens like in yard sales or um, vintage shops, things like that. Anything. You can go to the fabric store if you want and pick fabrics that you really like. Maybe you know somebody who sews. If you know anybody who sews and you're not a sewer, they will have scraps. Ask and you, you will receive. Another thing I do like to do is I incorporate, you know, maybe little, I, I like to do, a, I dabble in a little rug hooking myself. I, as you could see, I incorporated some into my last project. You know, I might use some of my scraps and incorporate those into my quilt. You're not, it doesn't have to be fabric. It doesn't have to be flat. It doesn't have to be cotton. I know sacrilege if you're a quilter, but it doesn't have to be. It can be an old t-shirt. It can be a stretchy fabric that you scrunch up. It can be anything. You'll need scissors. You'll need thread or embroidery floss. You'll need needles and pins, a hoop if you want. There are times when I like to use a hoop. A lot of times I don't. And if you are so inclined to want to mark things ahead of time, a non-permanent marking tool. I don't do as much of that as I used to, but sometimes if I'm going to be doing lettering or something like that, I will want to have that. Just make sure I would test whatever you're going to use before you put it anywhere. So now you can just free your mind and get stitching. Again, copy another artist at the beginning. You'll take the pressure off. That's the reason I tell you to do that is it, it just lets you be free. I want you to be free and creating for the sake of creating, not worrying about, you know, being original or anything at the beginning. Start small. Don't make a big bed size quilt. Don't make a huge wall hanging if you're embroidering. Just do a little you know, 12 by 12, eight by eight, whatever fits in your hoop and decide you're gonna fill that hoop. Or maybe you wanna make a placemat if you're making a quilt, do something small. Don't worry about technique at the beginning. Enjoy the act, it's just like anything else. When you start it, you're gonna be a little messy, a little sloppy. Think about when you learned how to roller skate or ice skate, how awkward you felt. Um, I do like to think about things that take time that take rhythm, riding a bike, skating, things like that are, are actually really good comparable types of activities to something that you're going to be doing with your hands. Get your toolkit together that we talked, we spoke about what you need before. Gather everything. I like to have, I have all these like bags. Whenever I get a project, I make a bag for that project or I'll have an on the go. We have an on the go bag. I have a bag at home. I have different projects for different, different, you know, scenarios, I guess you could say, get all your materials together, put them with your toolkit. And then if you want to make a plan, if you're like, I have a friend who's having a baby, I want to make a little baby quilt, make that plan, put the, make it, you can draw it, you can sketch it, but just be open to changing it as you go along. Or maybe I also like to keep a notebook in my sewing bag because as I'm going and ideas occur to me for future projects, I can jot them down. It's kind of like keeping a bed or a book by your bedside, on your bedside table. You know, you have these thoughts and you think you're going to remember them, but you don't always remember them. So that's a little tip. Just keep a little, a little notebook in your bag at all times. 
hold on, I skipped over a slide. Oh, try different things. This is, you know, we're talking about stitching by hand and by hook today. We, you know, we're kind of focusing on the needle and the hook, but you can do anything you can do. You know, you look on Instagram, look on Pinterest, look and see what appeals to you. Maybe you try stitching by hand today and you're like, not my thing. And you grab that hook and you feel like you found your, you know, you were separated at birth from this rug hooking hook. You, you're going to feel it when you know it. So try different things. Punch needle, quilting, mending, rug hooking, macrame, embroidery, knitting, crochet. There's so many different things. Those are all fiber. I mean, that's not even doodling or painting or, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things out there. One thing that is important to, I know both Haley and myself, and we both incorporate a lot of this into our work is reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, using recycled materials is not only good for the environment, but it again, will challenge you to be more expressive, to be more creative, to think outside of the box. Um, you can, you can use, t-shirts, you can use old sweaters, you can use all kinds of things to turn into, you know, strips for hooking, to use as a background when you're stitching, to turn into yarn if you're knitting. You can take a damaged garment and either cut it up and reuse it, or as, you know, we showed earlier in the slide about Zach, you know, he found this tattered shirt and just flattened it out and put it on a quilt and away he went. You can use fabric that, like I said, maybe somebody else has given you from their stash or you have your own stash. And you can even look at your packaging, look at your things that you buy. You know, a lot of times we buy a bag and it comes inside of a bag or you get a little soap that's in a little bag. You can all sorts of things that you can reuse and recycle when it comes to your artwork. Um, I will say, you, we all have this tendency, you start hoarding a lot of fabric. So find a way to kind of keep it straight. It's worth hoarding it, but you make sure that you use what you have, I would say. Instead of going out and buying something new, go visit what you've been hoarding. And I just want to thank everyone again um, for taking the time to listen to this presentation. We really believe in a practice of mindful, expressive stitching. We think that it really, for both of us, Haley and I both, we, we sit around and talk about it, that it has opened up our minds and sort of opened up our, our artistic practice and has, we've had changes and, um, just our direction of what we're doing and how we're doing things. It's helped us grow. We want to thank both the Rochambeau Library and Fiber Art Now for enabling us to put this program together. And thanks again. That was the Art of Expressive Stitching. And we would like to say thank you again to Rochambeau Library and Fiber Arts Now for allowing us to present this program. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you got something out of it and that it adds to your creative practice and brings a little mindfulness into your art artwork. Yeah, and if you wanna follow any of the other programs at Rochambeau Library, they do have a website where you can look at those programs. You can also go to fiberartnow.net if you're interested in that publication and their programming. You can follow me, Haley Perry, at loopbyloopstudio.com and me at lizbessel.com or on Instagram at Liz Bessel. And I know Haley is yep. all the social yeah, media, all the social media. We're, awesome. we're there. Yes. Thank you again.